Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And on this edition of the podcast, I'm speaking with Ben Belkin. Ben first came on my radar as a contributor to Thursday Night Knives and quickly became our, res- our resident traditional knife expert, sharing with us his incredible collection of custom and rare production slip joints. But now the news is out. Ben has started his own knife company, Jack Wolf Knives cool name, following his dream as a knife junkie and his instincts as an entrepreneur. And I'm really excited uh, to take a walk down Slip Joint Street with Ben tonight. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and share this video if you're watching on YouTube. Also, while you're there, check out our other shows. We have knife review videos, Thursday Night Knives, our live stream, and our Knife Junkie Town Halls, where you can meet and talk with knife makers, and personalities you know and love. If you're listening to this podcast, tell a friend. Uh, Make sure that it's a friend who likes knives, otherwise they will think you're crazy. And if you want to support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Uh, The quickest way to get there is by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The GetUpside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. GetUpside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit thenifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Ben, great to see you again, sir. I've seen you many times on Thursday Night Knives, but it's great to have you here on the show. Thanks, Bob. Always a pleasure to see you. Always a pleasure. Well, as I mentioned in the uh, introduction, um, you were you first introduced yourself to me and to and to this uh, show's community as a uh, a collector of just amazing slip joint knives. I mean, you've shown us a lot of what you have in your collection. Um, how did you start off in this in this thing? With slip joint knives? Yeah, with collecting yeah. the way you collect. So the way I collect is part of my addictive personality that I was born with, I suppose. <laughs> um, but slip joint knives. So back, I think, around maybe 2013 or 14, I started collecting knives again. I originally started collecting knives as a kid, like so many people on your show. And... I was buying spider co's and trying to find knives that a left-handed person, you know, can use, which leaves you to back locks. And after trying all the spider co back locks, I was looking for something different, stumbled across some videos on YouTube, great Eastern cutlery. I said, I got to find one of those (laughs) and called up, actually I called up knife ship free because I saw they sold them. And I said, where are people getting these? Like, how do you hustle to get the good ones? And the dude on the phone, I don't even know who I talked to, but I said, give me the slip joint guy, you know, when I called. (laughs) And he told me about a Facebook group called Slip Joint Paradigm uh, that was where, like, the hardcore slip joint dudes were um, back in, you know, now it's probably 2014, 2015. And once I saw, like, under the rug at that world, I was hooked. So why why, uh, was Great Eastern Cutlery the one that first – raised your interest so yeah i guess i got my hands on a case knife actually um that's what really sort of piqued my interest in a traditional knife my mother-in-law gave me a case peanut that was hers from when she was a kid her father gave it to her and it was sharpened to death the joints were like rusted you could barely open it but i looked at it and i was like this is so different from anything i've ever seen Um, and so I started looking up these types of knives and I saw great Eastern cutlery and I could tell right away from the pictures that that was something special. I actually bought one case knife on Amazon first because you couldn't get the great Easterns as easy. It was a, like a seahorse whittler. And like, I opened up the box, the shield fell out, you know, (laughs) it's just disappointing. And so I said, I got to get my hands on one of these great Eastern cutleries. And that's when I saw what good traditional cutlery is made of 
So uh, to you, does it matter or does it matter to you that Great Eastern Cutlery makes these traditional style knives, these uh, slip joint knives in the traditional way with the traditional machines? Um, in with that using an old process, is that part of it, uh, part of the connection? Uh, it's certainly part of the charm. I don't think it has mm. to be that way, you know, but it's part of the story. It's part of the heritage and their product. It comes out in their product, you know, like when you handle their product versus even a modern traditional life, it's not going to be the same. And that's because they're using hundred plus year old machines and they're using labor methods that are as old as those machines. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the charm. I don't think every slip joint has to be that way, but I think for a great Eastern cutlery type knife, that's what helps make it special. Uh, do you think that anyone right now is, uh, is, is doing what GEC is doing, but in using the modern techniques and modern, uh, modern materials and such? Uh, the custom makers do it some, but obviously that was the hole I saw in the market was that there really isn't a production knife available with all the features that it should have, the patterns, the blade shapes that hearken to the tr aspects of traditional knives that everybody likes in modern materials. It, it hasn't been done specifically the way I want to do it. Now I'd say the closest thing is what Mike does at Lion Steel. I mean, he's very consistent with that, but there's some things he does that are going to be different from the way I do it. Do you mean Mike Latham at collectorknives.net? Yes, yeah. Yep. Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, I hate to show off, but I was just carrying one of his prototypes today. Uh, this beautiful gun stock. We're going to talk about, I love this knife, but yeah, he's kind of doing uh, some of the some of the things you're you're talking about with uh, updating processes and materials, but giving um, but giving you that uh, that traditional that traditional knife. Okay, okay, all right. We tell me about Jack Wolf knives. Tell me about the inspiration, the name. Tell me all about it. Sure. So my grandfather was Jack Wolf Belkin. That's where I got the name. And the first knife I ever had was his. And I would go over to his house, you know, as long as I can remember backwards. And he always carried Swiss Army knives. Now, Swiss Army knife is a slip joint knife. You know, a lot of guys' grandparents carry, or grandfathers carried the traditional case knives or Schrade. But my grandfather, he was a builder. He loved all the little tools in the Swiss Army knife. So, you know, I used to like swoop those from him when I was little and drop it in my pocket, take it home. And my parents would, you know, steal it back and give it back to him. And I was just enamored with his pocket knives. Um, and that, that seed was planted and it never, ever died. You know, that plant never died, so to speak. You know, as soon as my, you know, I would start to get Swiss army knives and knives for my birthday from my parents or from my grandparents or my aunts and uncles. And soon you got a drawer full of them. And then when I got old enough to buy bigger blades, I had like a little showcase on my bedroom wall with like my Rambo three knife in it and <laughs> yeah. just like Gil Hibben Mortal Kombat thing that, you know, like a fantasy knife. And right. it just grew. I had Ninja Stars from the flea market in there. And so the love for knives, that primal love that we all understand who watched this channel, right? Yeah. Like that fire was lit by my grandfather. So the name of the company is to honor him. Um, he was a big part of my life when I was a kid and I always uh, looked up to him. So it was really cool to name it after him. And, you know, just the, the concept of the company is to do a extremely high quality traditional knife in modern materials. That's what I want to do. And my, uh, little slogan on my website is modern interpretation of timeless design. Hmm. So yeah, one thing I, I see a lot of the modern slip joints do is they come out with these like unique patterns that look very modern or very space age. And to me, while for some people they may like that to me, it misses the mark a little bit, you know, like why reinvent the gun stock? Why reinvent the Eureka? Why reinvent the Trapper? Why reinvent the Barlow? You know, like 
why reinvent the sow belly? These are patterns that have worked for centuries. And no matter who makes them, as long as they do it right, people buy them and we love them. So, yeah, that's my approach. And, you know, just take what resources I have. And I saw the path to do this. And I said, let's let's try it out. Let's see what we can do. Uh, that's interesting that you talk about modernizing the slip joint designs and how it it falls flat with you or or um you know that you know hits hits the wrong tone for you um but sometimes you'll see one and it's arresting you know you see you know it's a you know it's a slip joint you know it's in that format you know the non-locking format and but you see a design that's totally modern and it's it's arresting. I could see how to a connoisseur such as yourself that could uh, that could rub you the wrong way. Sometimes it rubs me the wrong way. Other times I'm fascinated. Like every once in a while, you'll see a tanto uh, sh blade shape in a um, in a traditional. And whenever I see that, it's thrilling. It's like spotting a rare bird to me. But at the same time, it's it's uh, you could see it as sort of mixing your you know, mixing your metaphors or something. Right. And I think there's exception to that rule. Like Jared Ozier's work, Ozer, mm. yeah. uh, out of this world, right? Like his creativity, his artistic expression, like he has full creative license to make up any new slip joint that he can dream up, in my opinion. But I feel like maybe not everybody can pull that off. Mm. <clears throat> and, you know, there are other guys too. So I don't want to knock anyone's work, believe me. I just think for me, the opportunity I saw was to rely on the classics because the classics are here for us to enjoy, for our sons to enjoy and for their sons to enjoy. And, you know, they were perfected centuries ago and to put a twist on it with the materials, as opposed to with a reimagination of the shapes and patterns is what suited my taste and what I saw as an opportunity to, to make a business out of. Dare I say sons and daughters. I, I uh, bought yes. my, got my daughter, one of these, uh, a smaller version of one of these, you know, the uh, lady, lady boot foot. I, I'm not exactly sure what they're called, uh, but I got her a small one. She's 10 years old. She loves it. Everything, everything, everything she opens now, she's opening it with that. Um, so I, yeah, I, I'd say the appeal is, is great. So you, Talking about all of these traditional patterns, um, I think it's kind of cool. To me, when I think of um, the fact that there are these established traditional patterns in, in slip joint knives uh, that have come down to us, it reminds me of the great American songbook. You know, all the songs that Billie Holiday sang are the same songs that Ella Fitzgerald sang and that uh, Frank Sinatra sang, you know what I mean? Like uh, through the whole period of, of jazz, uh, and and that sort of earlier 20th century American music, there were there were standards, you know, and and you played the standards, and how you put your twist on the standard is is how you um, stuck out, and and to me, what you are um, what you will, are doing with Jack Wolf knives is is kind of a similar thing. You're like a Frank Sinatra. Yeah, yeah, that's a good comparison. I like that a lot. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I agree. I agree with your analogy that that's exactly what we're talking about. So uh, I've noticed recently, okay, I've, I've been following you a long time on Instagram. Uh, before I knew you, before you introduced yourself on the show on uh, Thursday Night Knives, and I knew, I realized recently that you've been showing a, a preponderance of Great Eastern Cutlery uh, number 15s, and not just your run-of-the-mill 15, and it's hard to call any GEC run-of-the-mill, but you've got a spectacular collection of like very rare and, and hard-to-find um, 15s. Uh, that, that's, if you don't know what we're talking about, that's a boy's knife style. It's got this same kind of handle shape and uh, different blade configurations. So I, I'm taking it that you really love that design in particular. What what are the patterns that uh, ring truest to you? What what patterns do you just love the most? Yeah, so the 15, right? That's for the audience. That's a three and a half inch closed sleeve board, which is narrow at the top than it is at the bottom, like something you'd iron a sleeve on. And <clears throat> albeit maybe a little small for a lot of people at three and a half inches closed, it's just right as far as 
an everyday knife and for collectability to me it was the charming most awesome knives that GEC was making and to boot that's what they make the TC Barlow out of and in my opinion that TC Barlow is like the quintessential American traditional knife you know always run in relatively small numbers with these exotic handle materials and that beautiful big bolster with the stamp TC on it. Like when I saw that, I was like, that's it. Like that is it. That's the pinnacle of a traditional knife. It's not the most complicated. It's maybe not multi-bladed. So maybe it's not the most useful, but like that is it, that, that, that gets it. So sorry, I'm kind of roundabout. So that 15 enamored me and they've made it in so many different um, configurations like electrician's knives, um, punch knives, multiple blade shapes, single blades, two blades. It just made it really a joy to collect. Now, it's not the only pattern I like. Um, it's probably my favorite, but I really like that 85 bullet end. I really mm. like a sway back. I love a Sally. You know what? My favorite patterns are, are found in the ones I've drawn to the company. I basically just started with the ones that I love um, and tried to bring them to you guys. Yeah, that's that's one thing I really like about the Barlow. You're sort of touching on you sort of touched on is that um, you know, it at least the way GEC reiterates them. Um, they're highly collectible, but at the same time, they were a working person's knife. Uh, that that big bolster is there to shore up the blade, so that if you're working hard with it, um, you know you, you it's there for extra strength. But it also looks beautiful, and so it's a it's a f um, form following function kind of thing. And uh, I think that's kind of at the heart of of what you're doing here. So. When you, how many, how many designs does Jack Wolf have so far? So over the weekend, I designed my 12th one. Ooh, okay. Uh, it, do you mind? Uh, could you tell us what kind of a pattern that was? I figured you'd ask. <laughs> so you want a little sneak peek before the rest of the internet gets to see it. Oh yeah. So it's a Barlow. It's my first Barlow and I'm calling it the midnight Jack Barlow. And it's got a coffin influence. And uh, it's the first time I've done a sheep's foot or a long pole. That blade is gorgeous. What do you, what do you mean uh, coffin influence? So the, the um, where are we at? The bolster or the, the bottom of the knife, the top of the knife, like this, those three edges mm -hmm. would be like on a coffin handle knife. Bowie, like a, like a Bowie with a, yeah, I see what you're right. saying. Right. See, now that's something I haven't seen before on a Barlow. I just haven't seen that. Right. So actually I got some inspiration for that at the ICCE show when I was walking through that show, looking at all the knives, which is just a really cool way to get inspiration, by the way, is go to these knife shows. There's so much cool stuff. Um, but in one of the dealer showcases was this gigantic slip joint that bill rupel made i mean it was at least five inches closed maybe six wow and it had a very similar shape it was two bladed um and it was chamfered the way mike latham does his knives but it just struck me like man that's cool you know i want to maybe tone that down a little bit this is three and three quarters inches closed this one mm. which i think is the sweet spot for a slip joint so yeah so you know i like to I'll be the first to admit this is, I'm not Mr. Original with this stuff. You know, I'm relying on the giants who came before me to stand on their shoulders and say, thank you for this amazing body of work you guys have produced through the, through the centuries. Just let me kind of put my spin on it here and, and re-deliver it for people who are looking for something like this. So that's where, that was the approach with this one. So what gave you the, temerity in the first place what what gave you the inspiration or or the feeling that man I, I think i could do this the whole project yeah the whole project yeah so that's a good question i think you know i turned 40 right i have my 40th birthday and so i started to reflect like some may do at that milestone and 
really wanted to have a project in my life that is like my legacy, you know, mm-hmm. something that I could put all my heart and soul into and spend the next 40 years doing. So that was where that whole idea was born. And <clears throat> so then I started looking at my resources and, you know, thinking about what I like, what are my resources and how can I put that together to create an opportunity? And when I started to analyze that, one thing really stood out and that was, you know, maybe we can make some knives. Um, Those resources would be, at the time I wasn't considering drawing in CAD because it'd been so long since I'd done it. I figured I'd have to farm that out. Um, But, you know, knowledge on how to run a business, knowledge of the product from having so many through my hands, some strategic relationships, um, specifically my friend and maker, Enrique Pena, um, and really just ultimately the desire to do this. Um, Now, the connection I needed and the help Enrique gave me was the introduction to the factory. So when he checked that box for me, it really helped me see the path forward. And when it came to getting some technical advice on how to design the joints or what to look for. Um, He's been there to help me with that too. So when I had the industry support I needed and the factory connection I needed, everything else, I just saw the path and I just started getting after it. So Enrique Pena, um, uh, you have quite a collection of his custom slip joints, right? Yeah. Yep. I do. Not as much as some others, but I got a decent chunk. (laughs) So uh, you don't have every single one, but close. <laughs> no, not even. I mean, that guy, he pumps them out, man. He really does. It quite, he doesn't make as many slip joints anymore as he used to. Yeah, he's um, had such great success with, with his uh, frame locks, his, uh, those frame lock folders with the skull uh, clips, if you're unfamiliar with him. Um, I mean, he makes some beautiful knives, but they, they definitely straddle a number of different uh, types. Is that something you're going to be uh, – is that something you're interested in? Or are you dead? Are you kind of dead centered right now on the slip joints? I have a lot of uh, ideas for growth in the company. I'm going to build my foundation on these slip, you know, assuming I'm successful, right? right if right. I'm successful coming out of the gate and I can keep this going, yes, we're going to build our reputation and our company on slip joint knives. But there's a great opportunity to develop some of these into locking knives. You know, I love a frame lock knife. I love a Chris Reeves frame lock knife. I'm utterly impressed by his knives. And so I'm by no means only a slip joint guy, you know. It's just probably my forte. But I like lots of things at the buffet. So, (laughs) yeah, you know, I want to do frame locks. I want to do fixed blades. But before I do that, I want to really perfect my process here and build a strong audience and a strong brand before I branch out. Right. You know, uh, locking knives can have a traditional sort of uh, look or a, or form factor. This is a, another one of Mike Latham's prototypes. It's a swing guard. And this one is made by Lion Steel. The last one I showed was made by Fox. And, you know, the, you know, the swing guard, uh, the cheetah is what it is kind of the Kleenex name for it. Cheetah is the case branding of this style of swing guard knife. Um, so incidentally, a lot of people just call them cheetahs, but I mean, Mike, Mike took this old thing, this old design and, and really optimized it. There's no rattle, there's no nothing, this or that. Uh, but also it's a locking blade and it's traditional. There are, there are a lot of ways. It seems like there are a lot of ways if you start with a slip joint to grow in any direction you want, you know? Um, so with the CAD and with the designing, tell me about your process. Like, um, in terms of design and then, and then uh, I'm, I'm presuming that y- your relationship with this manufacturer is already up and running and you have a, is there a dialogue going back and forth? And then how does that work with the, with your design process? Do you bounce it back and forth? How does that work? Great, great question. So when I started, I said, I'm going to draw these on paper and, the fa- as, you know, the factory can try to convert them into a working drawing from a paper drawing. Well, my paper drawings look terrible. Like I was not getting what I saw in my mind on paper. And so, you know, fortunately, 
back in high school in the night in the late nineties, um, our high school, I'm from the Detroit area. I actually went to the same high school. Me and Brian Efros went to the same high school, which oh. was an interesting thing to find out. Um, and in our, because we're in the Detroit area, we had a very robust drafting and CAD program because kids go right into the auto industry. All right. So that was like super fortunate. And I really, really bonded with that teacher in high school. It was like really one of the only teachers I got along with and I got in trouble in other classes. So because I, enjoyed him as a teacher and I enjoyed the work. I pretty much took every class I could with that guy. And that was technical drafting, which we did by hand on big drafting boards. We had like the blueprint machine in the corner. It smelled like ammonia and all that. <laughs> and then AutoCAD on what was released 12 at the time on big black and white computers, really old fashioned CAD compared to what's today. And so that's where I learned it. I learned drafting by hand. I learned AutoCAD and I took a lot of architectural drafting classes because that's what I started college as an architecture major. It's what I thought I wanted to do. Um, so anyway, it's kind of roundabout way to answer your question, but so I picked up years of drafting. I used it in my early career and then for 15 years I haven't touched it. And so when I tried to draw those drawings in pencil and I saw how bad they looked, I was like, I just got to draw these in CAD and I don't want to rely on someone to do it because the back and forth is going to waste so much time. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm capable. So I went online and I saw that there was a 30 day free trial with AutoCAD is not cheap. You know, it's like over a thousand dollars a year. And I was like 30 day free trial. I'll see how bad I suck. And I downloaded it and it just started coming back to me. All the keyboard commands like L to draw a line, C to draw a circle, TR to trim a line, o offset to offset a line. And like, I was like, man, this is, this is great. You know, like I forgot how much I loved it. I forgot how much I loved drafting. So my first, when I started drawing these knives in the beginning, I would draw like a front view, a side view and a bottom view. Cause that's how we learned how to draft parts, you know, like the three views hmm. and that gave the factory. So at that time, then I started communicating with the factory. Here's my crappy CAD drawing. Um, and they would take it and produce a working drawing in 2D. And there was, in the beginning, a lot of back and forth. Like the first five knives I designed, we had, I think, nine or ten revisions. As I sort of worked through reestablishing my skill set and refining aspects of the knives that I originally thought I wanted, but that turned out not being what I really wanted or that Enrique looked at it and was like, no, you know, don't do that. Change this, move that. If you move this here, you have to adjust this. And so it took a couple months, nine revisions to sort of just get the hang of producing a drawing that the factory could then reproduce the way I wanted it to look, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Uh, first of all, a couple of things um, in what you just mentioned. We have we have some parallels here. About I I, I got about ten years on you, right? But uh, in the late eighties, when I was in high school, I took architectural drafting. I loved it. Um, and you know, AutoCAD. If you were on twelve, this must have been negative one. You know, I don't know. <laughs> a very old AutoCAD. Um, I did not like that so much. I liked the pen and paper or the the pencil and paper kind of drafting, but that's kind of interesting. Also, I was born in the Detroit area as well. So it's kind of, we moved to Cleveland shortly after that, but uh, kind of some interesting parallels there. But um, uh, you're, you're talking about um, uh, you know, bringing, bringing these designs, sending them over. You said you had, you sent some, some early crappy designs. Like, what is the learning curve for drawing something that you or or designing something, whether it's on pen and paper or on AutoCAD, that you like, that you think looks good, that's expressing what you want to express with a knife design, but then you get into the very real world of mechanics, and is this going to work? Is it all going to fit together? Uh, what was that learning curve like for you? It was it was rough for a while because I would draw it without the mechanics, right? I would just draw the handle and the blade sticking out. And so to me, that's how it needs to look. But then they would draw it as parts. And once they fitted the parts together, it changed the way it looked. And then I would say, okay, well, hmm. I need to fix it because you screwed it up, you know? So I would 
start moving parts around and then like you'd rotate a blade and you'd see you can't do that you know like now that it's closed the handle's hanging out the bottom or the tip of the blade's hanging out the bottom or the it's not the the, the tang is like halfway through the back spring and so you you like you start to get your hands on this relationship between all the parts and the best way i could describe it it's like a complex puzzle where you're trying to fit all these little pieces together and get them just right and that's the pivot the tang the bolster the blade the width of the blade the length of the handle the width of the handle and it's mm -hmm. like and you got three positions to contend with open half stop and closed so like i'll sit down on a sunday which is the day i draft because people don't there's less interruption, right? Like I'm not getting emails and phone calls. Mm -hmm. So I can sit down for like 10 hours and like tunnel into the zone and start like moving lines and moving things and drawing stuff and sort of, I don't know, reverse engineering the process in my own mind, if that's mm -hmm. the right phrase, like start with one, they, the factory completed and move it, and move parts. And it's taken me a good you know, 10, 11 knives to get to the point where I'm like, okay, like I see now in my head before I sit down to draw this, like how I'm going to construct this puzzle. And it's like, you go to war with the thing. You're like, get it. And it's like, man, that doesn't look right. So now I got to change this curve, but you change the curve and now something else doesn't look right. And it's like, I don't, it's hard to put into words the experience, but it's extremely gratifying to sit there and wrestle with that drawing until it's working in all three positions and it is aesthetically pleasing. So you are wrestling with form and function at the same time. You're, you're, uh, you know, uh, it's like, uh, you make one move on one place and you're compromising the other. And then you have to, it seems like you have to kind of go back and forth you know ultimately what you want it to look like and how you want it to function. But the puzzle or the mystery is how it's going to work, you know, when you're putting it together, it seems. Exactly. And, you know, designing is one thing, making is another. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I would yeah. love, to, I intend to learn to make knives. I need to have the hands-on experience in a knife maker shop need to grind blades, need to shape tangs, you know, all that needs to happen at some point. But right now I'm designing. And I think a lot of makers, they just start from an established pattern. But because they're learning to make, but I'm trying to draw a knife from scratch. So I'm like figuring out how to design. And yeah, you you wrestle with this thing until it until it works and it looks good. So definitely aesthetics, definitely function. And it's gotten to the point, my last few I did for sure, like I draw it once, I send it to the factory, they convert it into their drawing, full 3D, and everything is the same. Like they haven't had to widen things or shrink things or move things, like bam, it works. So you've developed an instinct after designing 10, 11, 12 knives. So you can approach it with less struggle and kind of express yourself a little more freely at this point. Yeah, I think there's still, it, it's still a struggle, but I don't struggle myself into a corner as often to where I have to basically crumple it up and start again. Like that sow belly was so hard, man. That sow belly I designed, I had probably 30 hours in that drawing. I had to crumple it up and start over three or four times. It has so many curves, the relationship with the blade and the, uh, pivot and the curved bolsters and everything yeah it's going to be called the javelina jack and fortunately one of my friends online told me i spelled javelina wrong so i'm <laughs> thankful for that yeah i'm glad i caught that before i went to print on labels but sorry, I digress. It's like, no one you know small business you don't have people proofreading for you, you just, right you just go for it look at this but yeah it i'm sorry go ahead but yeah um yeah, it, it's, it's been, it, it's been, I, of course you pull up this one. I got the nail nick on the reverse side on that one picture. So the one that I got, I got to fix that one. Another small business mistake. Um, but yeah, so I got a dog leg. I have like a Warncliffe trapper. I have a sway back, a gun stock, a bullet end, a coffin, just all the patterns that I think are awesome. 
Yeah. So uh, you you have. I mean, we're looking right now. If you if you can't uh, if you're not watching this right now, definitely go to jackwolfknives.com and and uh, uh, Ben's eleven designs are up, and you can see them in the closed position, the open position, and uh, with various um, uh, uh, simulated materials. But uh, when uh, in looking at this, I the one I, I mentioned this. To you, I mentioned this to you in an email. The one to me that I thought was maybe your own uh, handle design was the Venom Jack. Uh, it's a that, that's a um, it's a Warncliffe, right? Uh, yeah, Warncliffe that... blade. You know, along the lines of a trapper, um, mm -hmm. but a little more streamlined. Well, that flared pommel is something that is uh, you know it's a it's a pretty subtle design. Uh, aspect there but to me i saw that i was like wow that looks totally unique and maybe maybe it's due to the fact that it's paired with that warren cliff blade um but i saw that and i thought well this is interesting because you're working with very established patterns but you're still putting your english on it you know right the, so my commitment is i don't trace you know what i mean like i'll look at something and then i'll draw it myself but i don't trace someone else's stuff right. so it's always gonna be like if you draw a pic if you draw a picture of the sun and i draw a picture of the sun like they're both the sun but my picture is always going to be my picture you know and so that's why they'll always have at least just something different about them because i i it's original work so you've mentioned the manufacturer a couple times i don't know if 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 uh well, you haven't told me who it is, but I'm I'm curious if that's something you're you're disclosing yet. Uh, is it, can you tell us? Yeah, who's, we can. Oh. Yeah, I, it's no secret. It's Riot. Um, that's who oh. I've been working with. A little company you may have heard of called Riot. They they know how to put together a knife, don't they? They do. Yeah, no, oh that's God. the introduction Penyon gave me. As you guys may know, mm. they make his mm. X series knives, and they made a slip joint for him, and so he's helped them work out the mechanics and the building of a slip joint. I, I'm sure I speak for many of us. It's tremendously exciting to know that these beautiful designs that you can see on jackwolfknives.com are going to be produced by uh, Riot because, I mean, I just put up a video on, on my Riot K2 just this very same day. I love that knife. It, it I mean, I love, I have two of their knives right now. Uh, I had to wind down the collection a little bit, but they just, oh my gosh, they're, they're really perfect production knives. Well, so how, how does the materials thing work into this now? Oh, look at this. So Jim has up uh, a, a nice spread with, with all your designs open and closed and with the simulated handle materials. And so that's actually a good segue. What are the materials you've been talking about? Um, modernizing. I love that Eureka too, with that giant fat bellied spear point blade. Spear point is not my favorite traditional blade shape, but I love how you make it uh, a, a heavy bellied spear point. But, but I, I get, I, I, I digress here. What are the materials you're going to be using? So the bolsters and liners are integral, which means it's all one piece of titanium. Mm -hmm. And I put a one millimeter flute in the top and bottom bolster. And <clears throat> that was a touch that I basically was influenced by Ryu Kawamura's knives. So I have, you know, all these custom knives and I have the benefit of laying these things out in front of me with my digital calipers and measuring things and deciding what it is I like about this, what it is I like about that. Um, so yeah, so titanium integral bolsters that are fluted, titanium hardware screw construction, M390 hollow ground blades, because hollow if ground. you ask me, hollow ground by hand, right. they're, uh -huh. they hollow ground by hand. And, you know, they ask me, how do you want those blades ground? I'm like, there's only one answer to that question. You got to <laughs> hollow grind that blade, you know? Yeah. It's just such a nice touch. Um, and uh, yeah, so the... I draw them, I render them for the website in black, natural, and OD green canvas micarta. Those are kind of the three standbys that seem to have a lot of appreciation in the market that you can never really go wrong with. Mm -hmm. But I do not want to stop there. I want to 
explore more interesting types of micarta. Um, I'm talking to a micarta manufacturer now about getting some interesting slabs from them. Hmm. <clears throat> I'll consider uh, fat carbon fiber because they can source that. And I think that's really cool. Um, in the beginning, I'm going to veer away from natural material, wood, bone, uh, mainly wood and bone. And I know that's going to be disappointing to some people, but um, I have personally had issues with shrinking and swelling of that mm. material. And it's just an unfortunate reality of uh, pervious natural material. And also, I think, you know, it veers away a little bit from the modern traditional when you're using the traditional handle materials. That being said, I love bone. I love wood. Yeah. So I intend, if I'm successful and can keep this going, to do some testing with their handle materials that they can source, make sure they don't shrink, make sure they don't swell. Because what will happen, in case you guys don't know, is, man, if that thing shrinks down, it can yank on the screws. It can lock up the knife. Uh, wow. It can also crack. Yeah, I actually had to send a knife back. So I live in Arizona. It's bone dry. I got a custom knife from a maker in Oklahoma. Came to me. It seized up from the lack of moisture in the air. Locked the knife. Couldn't even open it. I was freaking out. I was like, what happened with this? You know, put it in a box, wrap it, you know, wrap it with some mineral oil, put it in a box, send it back. He puts it on a shelf. The next day it's working fine. So huh. like we just shocked that material. Um, kind of on a tangent here, but but that's the reason. What, what, what I've had, was that material? Was that a wood? It was ivory. Ivory. Okay. Yeah. And so so that I had that happen. That issue happened, and then with another maker uh, in Brazil, obviously very humid down there. Mm -hmm. Two knives, wood handles. One ebony. What was the other one? I don't remember honestly. Two wood knives, both shrinking problems, both cracking problems. Oh, it kind of burned me a little bit. I never, I just never thought of that. I mean, I've, I have old knives from my grandfather uh, with old Delrin that's uh, kind of shriveled up and stuff like that. But uh, it, it never occurred to me that regionally it, it, it matters. You know, I, I live, I've, I've always lived in the Northeast or the, the East, you know, uh, or in Ohio. And a lot of the uh, slip joint knives I have are made in Pennsylvania. So it's kind of all the same climate and uh, it's never, ever been an issue, but I never thought of that. It's made in one place. It's, it's, it's made to exist and made to perfection in that place and then sent elsewhere. And, you know, you just don't know how it's going to react. Yeah. We're talking about thousands of an inch precision, right? Yeah. So you put something in a human environment into a dry environment where my knives will be fulfilled out of Arizona. So that means they're going to be sitting in a place in Arizona. And can you imagine what problem I'm dealing with? If I have a whole batch oh my that gosh. screws up, I'm not exactly a knife maker, can't exactly fix those by hand myself. Right. So from a practical standpoint, you know, from it's a business decision in the beginning to stick with impervious materials. Man, I think that's... it's go ahead. Sorry. Nothing, please go ahead. Uh, I think, I think, it, and it, it is consistent with the design um, concept of the knives to stick with, micarta and other uh man-made materials well, it's just a very very smart and informed decision that that uh comes from obviously having a great business mind but also having a great collection of knives from you know custom knives from all over the place that you've had these experiences in the past you kind of knew what to look for uh because my my instinct as a as a slip joint collector a uh, much smaller collection than yours but i love them is you know oh my gosh you know give me this uh give me tortoise shell give me bone give me wood um uh and uh see see what happens you know because because that those are the materials i love for traditional um knives but uh yeah so you know you can jig uh, you can put jigging in micarta. Why not? You can you put can. jigging in, in carbon fiber. Probably. You can definitely jig micarta, right? Is that coming through? Look at that. Yeah. Yep. God, and gorgeous. so it's funny you say that because that's a conversation I'm going to have with the factory is, can you guys do this? And if so, you know, jig a piece and send it to me so I can see it. Can't, that's can't, awesome. uh, can't imagine they'd say no. They, they pretty much can do anything it seems like they can they can jig titanium i've seen it so i don't yeah. know why they couldn't jig micarta yeah pena has a couple of jig titaniums 
I think out yeah. there. His Lanny's clip. Uh, speaking of Lanny's clip, uh, was was there were there any special? I, I feel like I've heard a lot of people mention that designing a Lanny's is not as easy as it might seem. Did you have any special challenges with that design in particular? Yeah, it's <clears throat> it's not easy. That blade with its saber grind and it's you know it's a taller blade got to get the nail nick right yeah it's it's a beast because if you you can make it look ugly real easy is what i'll say and then it's just bigger so the handle has to be bigger and you know just folding that big blade into that handle so that you have all the grinds still outside the handle for that aesthetic effect that Alani's has <clears throat> it was it was a pain in the butt <laughs> and i actually recently just made some modifications to mine because the screw like you'll notice on a lot of these knives the screw is never smack dab in the middle of the bolster and you don't really see it on your traditional knives as much because there's a pin and it's hidden in the bolster right. um but it was just bugging me that it was as off center as it was so i fixed that over the weekend but you, you can't just move that screw and call it a day. You just change the relationship of the blade to the handle where it pivots. And that is a change that cascades through every single part of the knife. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the like <clears throat> I actually tweaked it on the Eureka, which I call the humpback jack, and the Benny's clip, which is my version of the Lanny's. Penny's clip. So the the vampire jack up at the top has that um well has a sort of coke bottle no not what do they call it that little uh coffin Yeah well the 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 uh oh, like the center swells Yes the center swells so my understanding is that's to accommodate the pin and the material that has to exist on that spring around the pin and that allows you to to put a larger blade or a broader blade in that handle. Exactly. I mean, that blade is almost the whole width of the handle. And, you know, truthfully, there is a lot of, I like that design for the aesthetics, but yeah. just like in the Eureka and just like on that knife, that hump is there to move the pin and open up the blade well. Hmm. So what, uh, how are you going to market these? What, what, um, what role are our knife shows going to have? What, what role is social media going to have? How are you going to get the word out about these? So I've been working on that every day. So knife shows, I'll go to the ones that are applicable every year. I'll go to blade. And by the way, everybody, if you want to see me at blade, I'm at table 16 C. Um, so you can see me there. I'll have, I should have my prototypes by then. It's a leap of faith buying that table before I got the prototypes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but you know, I have faith in the process and if not, I'll have pictures. I'll have something for you. Right. Yeah. So yeah, blade, blade West, ICCE, the gathering that's four. And then, you know, any more that makes sense to go to, I'll, I'll go to six, eight of them a year if I have to, but that's, it's amazing. You go to a knife show. It's amazing all these awesome people are there. You get to talk about what we could talk about the death and yeah, I don't, I mean, I know guys get burned out on it, but that's not going to happen to me anytime soon. So right. go to the shows. I'm on social media every day, posting on my personal page at Benny B three, five, seven out of my personal collection. Cause I have a bigger following there. I'm building up the at Jack Wolf knives, Instagram page. Going to be posting a lot of content there. Facebook, I've been more active on Facebook over the years than I have on Instagram. <clears throat> I'm in, I don't know, 15 or 16 knife groups. I post in those groups every single day. I post a collection, a piece from my collection every day, and I've been advertising my CAD drawings and stuff. And yeah, just like the, the modern grassroots, right? Like we don't mm -hmm. fly our parking lots anymore. We get on social media and we post and we get people excited. <clears throat> I've had great response from enthusiasts you know people in my inbox every day asking me questions telling me how excited they are telling me their favorite patterns and i, I honestly think like you know i want to get these in the hands of the guys who really love them and they'll be enthusiastic as i am and just try to spread it that good old-fashioned way through enthusiasm 
Yeah, and and even if you ended up sitting at table six H or whatever you said at at Blade Show, and you didn't have, uh, and and you you had not one um, prototype for people to put in their hands. It's your, well, first of all, you'll have the designs that they can see, but it's your enthusiasm, your obvious love of this stuff. Uh, and, and, and as you know, as a custom knife collector, there's a big um, personal connection. Like that personal connection with the custom knife maker means a lot. And there's no reason why that um, personal connection uh, that valued connection couldn't be made with someone who's making small batch production knives. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Like my heart and soul is in this project. Everything I give it, everything I have I'm working seven days a week to make this, not just a success for me, but I want everybody to love these, you know, like this is for us. This is for the community. <laughs> and that's what I truly feel. I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to even try you know, so even if I'm successful, it will just be icing on the cake. Every chat I have with another knife dude is like time well spent. You know, it's a bond <clears throat> and I, I just appreciate it. And yeah, like um, just sharing our enthusiasm for this stuff. Like, let's face it, this is an emotional thing for a lot of us, right? Yeah. Like yeah. we appreciate this stuff because it's functional art. Like we appreciate these knives because they're functional art. We appreciate the way it makes us feel. We appreciate the relationships we get collecting them. And we appreciate their, their beauty and how well they do a job. <clears throat> and so that's what I like to feel. That's what gives me the goosebumps, right? And so that's the conversations I want to have with everyone. That's the way I want people to feel when they buy my products. So I've noticed that all of your designs uh, so far are single bladed. Do you have any, um, I, I know when you introduce a second blade or heaven forbid a third or fourth blade, I mean, we've talked about this on Thursday Night Knives. There's so much more that goes into nestling those blades so that they don't rub, but so they're at the perfect angle so that everything fits. Do you have um, designs uh, on making uh, multi-bladed designs? Is that something interesting uh, to you? Like for me, the Stockman, I love the Stockman. And, and you run into that sort of, you know, getting the three blades in there in a slender package. Is this something you're looking to do? I would say in due time. Absolutely. Due time. You know, that's like, I look at that. I'm like, I ain't there yet. You know? <laughs> but because <clears throat> I still have an opportunity to do, do these single blade knives do variations of the blade type on each handle, do cover variations on everything, add a second blade to everything. So like a secondary pen blade on a second spring. Mm -hmm. And then as my skills designing and as the factory themselves, you know, learn to produce these multi-blade knives, then we'll sort of evolve in that together. <clears throat> but I will... 100% drive in that direction, you know, like relentlessly drive in that direction till we're producing the best cutlery I'm completely capable of. Uh, I, I think actually that the uh, single bladed uh, slip joints have way more crossover appeal uh, to, to those who are interested, who, who, whose collections or knife interests are more in the modern realm. I think, uh, and I think the, number 15 the popularity of the gec 15 especially in that uh, coveted um you know single bladed clip point version has has really pointed that out and then you look at a lot of the the modern uh you know greg medford makes a slip joint that's single bladed all of the uh all of the beautiful single bladed uh knives that come out of uh lion steel a lot of them are single bladed and i think that uh those have a broader appeal. So I think it's kind of not only maybe out of necessity that you come out with a single bladed first uh, group of single bladed knives first, but I also think it's a smart business move. Yeah. I would not have come out of the gate with several multi-blade knives because the popularity of single blade knives is without question. You know, like I would say for every buddy who likes a two blade knife, there's 10 guys who like a yeah. single blade knife. And so from a business standpoint, for sure, that's why you see, that's why I haven't been pushing to develop multi-blade knives because I'd rather build this business. You know, the business has to be successful for me to have an opportunity to make a multi-blade knife. 
Um, right. So I see that sort of low hanging fruit, if you want to call it that, making really popular single blade knives that the dude who collects spider codes and bench mates would be like, you know, that would be a perfect first slip joint for me. It's titanium, mm. it's M390, it's hollow ground, you know, and like, what a cool shape. I don't have anything that looks like that. Man, that spring is so fun to play with. Hollow ground. I'm so excited you're making these hollow ground. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a sucker for that. And you don't see, you just kind of don't really see it that much. Uh, ironic, well, maybe it's not ironic, but a lot of case knives seem to be hollow ground. Uh, uh, but you know, we're, we're, we're talking about sort of a different realm here with yours. So how are people going to be buying Jack Wolf knives? Uh, is it going to be straight through your website? Are you trying to, will you be getting these into the hands of dealers? How's that going to work? Um, that is still debatable, right? Like I'm still exploring that. I, <clears throat> my intention is to sell them online, but one of my plans is when I go to blade is to talk with dealers and learn more about what they have to offer. You know, like what is their selling point? What is their audience? What is their reach? You know, what, what would be the benefit of me selling through them? So that hasn't been decided yet. I have the infrastructure and the wherewithal and the parts in place to sell direct. So that can certainly happen. And if there is enough dealer interest and it makes sense to me, then that can happen too. Well, it seems, you know, just from hearing you talk, but also seeing your, how much preparation, how much work you've put into this, also your expertise uh, and and your um, laser focused taste that comes from, you know, your awesome collection. It seems like you've got uh, unstoppable momentum now and it's a matter of time. I'm really looking forward to seeing these uh, um prototypes but uh it it seems like it already exists it seems like you're uh you're already at 100 miles an hour and uh and 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 just moving with momentum i you know what i feel like <clears throat> i feel like i got on a wave on my surfboard even though i've never surfed but i feel like i got on the wave and it's like this is the right wave and i have to do everything i can to stay on this wave because this is the one like I have gotten smashed into the ground by so many waves in my life, <laughs> just kicked my butt, you know, and, but I always get up and try again, but like, this is the wave, And you know what? I'm just going to ride it and enjoy every single minute I'm on this sucker. So yeah, yeah that's how it feels in my heart. Taking that uh, passion for knives and your entrepreneurial spirit, putting them together. I mean, that's so great because Oftentimes people, you know, people have one or the other. Um, I, I happen to, you know, be more on the uh, artistic side of things. And, uh, you know, I, I admire that entrepreneurial spirit. It's something I, I, I would like to cultivate in my life over the next 50 years, um, you know, assuming I live to 100. And uh, so I admire that. And I think, I think that those two, that, that passion and the ability to design mixed with that entrepreneurial spirit, you know, makes for kind of an inevitable success. Hopefully, hopefully I'm right about that. Um, I hope so, Bob. You know, it's, it's the pieces I had and it felt right. And I don't regret a minute of any of this. It has been such a pleasure, such a joy. I'm meeting great people. I'm having fun and it feels like the right thing to do. All right. So Ben, uh, I usually do this, uh, this with, um, knife reviewers and YouTubers and, and you're, you're kind of, uh, you're kind of half and half. You're an enthusiast who's turned knife brand owner. So I want, I want to put you through a speed round here, uh, to, to wrap up the show. This is a way for listeners to, to really test the cut of your jib in a, in a, in a quick, you know, quick session here. Uh, I have, I usually have it set up for more of a modern knife paradigm, but here it's in the slip joint paradigm. And I, I don't mean that, uh, I don't mean that in the, in the group way. So uh, I'm going to ask you uh, a one or the other question. I don't want you to think about it. I just want you to blurt. Ooh, I just thought of another one. Um, I just want you to blurt your answer. Okay. Just blurt away. So, so that I know what your real instincts are. Okay. All right. The first one is obvious. Fixed or folder? Folder. Okay. Traditional or modern? Traditional. Half stop or no half stop? Half stop. Okay. Oh, let me stop right there. Why? 
I meant to ask you this earlier. Why is a half stop necessary to you? So it's nothing to do with safety, you know? It's just the sheer satisfaction of operating that knife mm. from open to half stop to close. Like you take that away from me. It's like, no, why did you do that? There's no walk and talk, right? Without a half stop. No, you know, I don't want to bash knives. Don't have them. Right. Because they're still great knives. And from what I understand, they're actually more potentially more difficult to make because you have to have that tank perfectly rounded and smooth to have it smooth all the way through. But like best part of a traditional knife is that walk and talk that, <laughs> from close to half, from half to open, feeling the weight, feeling how smooth it is, watching it road runner when it yeah. you know gets halfway there. Like, don't take that away. All right. All right. Fair enough. So flush at the half stop or doesn't matter? Doesn't matter. Okay. Clip point or spear point? Clip point. High carbon or stainless? High carbon. Uh, light pull or heavy pull? Heavy. Modern materials or traditional materials? Modern. Lanyard hole or no lanyard hole? No lanyard hole. Okay. GEC or Tuna Valley? GEC. Case knives or Queen Cutlery? Queen. Bill Howard era. Okay. Uh, Birdvis or J. Oser? Oser, sorry. Sorry I'll about go with that. Ozer. That's a tough one, man. <laughs> I know. Sorry, Nick. <laughs> uh, jigged bone or smooth bone? Oh, jigged. Uh, micarta or carbon fiber? Micarta. Okay. Form or function? Mm, I don't ever know. How do you define either one? You know, help me with that one. Define them for me and I'll answer you. Okay. Okay. Uh, is your main mission to make something that looks good? And and this is a this is a binary question. Is it is it better that it looks good or is it better that it works well? Works well, like in your hand and everything. No, no. I just mean does does just the, like it operates correctly? Does the job of a knife well, or looks like a good does knife? does the job of a knife well? But dang it, it can't be ugly. <laughs> All right, fair enough. And then last but not least, your desert island knife. The one knife uh, that you would keep for the rest of your life. Like not, out of the whole slew of knives or just traditional knife? Yeah, I, I'm not talking about you have to survive on a desert island. Okay. Um, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in your collection. Just if you had to only have one knife for the rest of your life from this moment forward, what would it be? I'll take a TC Barlow. TC Barlow. Well, what blade? That's extra credit. Clip point. Clip point blade, long pull, jig bone. I like it. I like it. Well, uh, Ben, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. This has been Ben Belkin of Jack Wolf Knives. We are so excited to see your knives in prototype form. And then, of course, we're excited to see Jack Wolf Knives' successful operation up and running. Thanks for coming on the show, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, always a pleasure. See you next week. <laughs> Ever start looking for your next knife purchase before your last purchase has even arrived? Then you're probably a knife junkie. All right. Well, there he is, living the dream, Ben Belkin. Man, a uh, lot of stuff we went over about traditional knives, about slip joint knives. And, uh, well, talking to him got me excited all over again. Um, I think uh, I sent him a list of my picks the other day, um, but I, I keep coming back to that Venom Jack. Uh, beautiful, beautiful thing. Look for uh, Ben Belkin and Jack Wolf Knives at Blade Show coming up. Uh, that's June 4th through the 6th. Also, I will be there, and uh, I can't wait to meet Ben in person, shake his hand, and uh, and all the rest of you who will be there. Uh, so for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying join us here next week for another great interview, and I will see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.